Uh, friends, today you can expect the second part of the video about panoramic photography. It's going to be right. And here it is. After the previous theoretical discussion about panoramic photography, uh, which was necessary. Today we are here to teach you, uh, what do we actually want to teach you? Uh, well, how to take panoramic photos, of course. You can look forward to a total of four videos packed with information and complete know-how. Uh, with a slight stretch, we can say that uh, you can expect the most detailed tutorial on panoramic landscape photography ever. From the previous video, we know the theoretical basics and we also know what photographic equipment we need. And now, let's take a look at how to do it. The first rule, we have to arrive at the chosen location at least 50 or 60 minutes before the planned shooting. Uh, more is better. We'll explore the area and carefully consider different compositions, formats, suitable lenses and focal lengths in advance. We won't fixate on one spot. It often happens that photographers climb a hill. By the time they reach the top, they have had enough. So they set up the tripod at the first spot they find attractive and take photos the entire sunrise or sunset from that spot. Upon returning from the shoot, they realize that if they had moved just 10 meters to the side, they would have had a much better composition. Therefore, let's not underestimate exploring the location before actual shooting. From each photo shoot, we aim to bring exactly defined source images for future panoramic photography. Shooting shouldn't be uh, done blindly, with the final selection made at home from lots of data. When planning future shots, we can think of different formats, squares and rectangles. These can be horizontal or vertical. Additionally, we can work with lightning conditions, with pre-sunrise, sunrise and post-sunrise compositions. Uh, the same of course applies to sunset. And we can also work with different focal lengths such as wide angle and on the other hand long focal lengths. The viewer shouldn't have the opportunity to realize that the photos are taken from the same location just the different lens. So the difference in focal lengths must therefore be significant. What lens should we actually use? 
As this scene and this composition is very wide, we should choose something that is wide enough. There is no sense in shooting this composition with 85 or 50, so let's just take 25 as it will be the easiest way to shoot this scene. It's necessary to know the location and the angle of flight at a given time. Uh, there are plenty of applications that can help us with that. Uh, for example, uh, sun surveyor or photopills. After selecting the location, we set up the tripod, which must be completely level. We discussed the topic in one of the previous video. If the tripod is not level, there will be stairs on the stick panorama, and we will have to crop the entire image. Okay, so the composition is ready. We have chosen the right lens and we have placed our tripod to a very sturdy place. It doesn't move at all. So now we are ready to shoot. Uh, Martin, are you pretty sure because the tripod doesn't seem to be leveled? Ha, you're right. This is a very common mistake that we must never do. Our tripod must be perfectly leveled. And I'm not talking about the legs. I'm talking about the base of our head. Okay, and how to do it? Come closer, I'll show you. In my case, it will be very easy because I'm using the leveling base. So I just loosen the knob, move this bubble to the center, tighten the knob, and I'm ready. And if I don't have leveling base? If you don't have the leveling base, it's a little more complicated because you have to use this bubble and adjust the length of each leg to level this bubble. After leveling the tripod, or using a leveling base, we focus to prepare the composition. And what are the basics of composition? Generally, compositions should consist of three plans, foreground, midground, and background. Why? Our eyes perceive reality in 3D, but the printed photo on the wall is only 2D, it's flat. In order to bring space back into such a photo, to give it a 3D effect, we must create composition using all three plans. You can see we have three plans in our composition. The first plan is this leading line, the beautiful rock formation leading down to the valley, to that village, which is our middle plan. And our background are um, the rocks behind that village. So we have all three plans in our picture. They are not interfering with each other. They are beautifully linked and together they work in a smooth composition. We must always be able to answer the question of what forms the foreground, midground and background in the photo. If we cannot answer these questions, then we have most likely not chosen the composition very well. Uh, do you know what photo will look really bad in terms of composition? Let's imagine we are in the Dolomites. We have beautiful mountain peaks in front of us. We completely feel the majesty of the mountains. And then we do something like taking a long lens, maybe 200 mil, and we photograph the composition in such a way that the mountain peaks grow from the bottom of the photo. And in front of the mountain peaks and behind them, there will be totally nothing. Such a photo will appear terribly flat and it will not engage the viewer. And we'll be surprised. After all, during the shooting, the scenery looks so beautiful and vibrant. And due to the poor composition arrangement, without foreground and background, we were unable to communicate the emotion we experienced during the shooting to the viewer. What is the purpose of the foreground? The foreground serves to guide the viewer into the photo. Let's envision it's an imaginary red carpet upon which we enter the photograph and look around to see what is actually in it. The viewer's gaze should extend from the middle ground towards the background. However, it is not determined which of the planes should carry the compositional weight of the photograph. In some cases, the foreground may be very attractive, while the middle ground and background are more like accessories. And of course, conversely, in some compositions, the foreground will be dull, but necessary for the 3D effect. And from the middle to the background, the photograph will gradually become more content rich. However, it's true that if any of the planes are missing from the photograph, 
the image loses its 3D feeling and attractiveness, even if the photographic conditions are excellent. And be careful about one thing. It's a common mistake, specifically the overlapping of planes. What do I mean? Usually a tree in the foreground extends into the background, into the sky. That is, it reaches from the bottom of the photo to almost its top. This kills the spatial depth. And now let's talk about something in the specifics of human vision. It is directed both from the blurry to the sharp, and we talk uh, more about this later, and from the dark to the light. Okay, but what is this information good for us photographers? Uh, for example, it's important not to leave significantly bright edges in the corners of photos, typically bright sky in compositions with waterfalls. What happens if we do? The viewer's attention is naturally captured and guided towards the brightest spot in the photo. And if the spot is on the edge of the photo, then the viewer's gaze literally falls out of the photograph. But it is not what we want, of course. Our goal is to capture viewer's gaze inside the photograph and leave them there to discover more and more interesting elements in the photo. In other words, our goal is to guide the viewer through the photograph and prevent him from falling out of the photo. In ideal conditions, the composition should actually create a kind of natural frame for the photograph. Often with a bit of humor, I say that in this context, Baroque painters had it easy. Let's imagine a typical Baroque painting. White ornate frames. And now try to stand in front of such a painting and escape your gaze away from it. It's impossible. You simply have to leave just like this. However, today's photo prints are either frameless or it's very thin frames. Therefore, it's important to create some kind of natural frame if the scene allows us even a little. And if nature hasn't been favorable to us in this regard, we can gently darken some of the edge areas of the photograph in post-processing to approximate that impression of a frame. We just need to be careful to make the darkening look natural. Working with a brush tool in the editor, adjusting the brush opacity and so on is necessary. But we'll talk about that in one of the later videos, where we'll focus on photo editing. Okay, now we know how the composition should look uh, at its best. We also know what to avoid when composing. But now a crucial question may come from any of you. Uh, namely, alright, thank you for the advice and tips, but how can we know what our final panorama will look like? Uh, yes, if someone asks this way, they will be right. For a single shot, it's basically simple. What we see on the display or through the viewfinder is what will photograph and that will be our composition. So right from the start of shooting, the photographer knows what their photos will look like. But what about panoramic photography? Of course, we can take a test shot. However, the test shot will be only one. It will represent only a partial segment of the final panorama. Moreover, we can decide to capture a 360-degree panorama in three or four hours. Then a single photo from the final composition will not disclose anything at all. Before making the final decision on which lens to use and how the overall composition will look, let's do a simple thing. Just pull out your phone, switch to panoramic mode, and capture exactly the panorama that we want to photograph with the camera. The response is practically immediate, so within a few seconds we'll find out whether the composition we had in mind will indeed be suitable. Now, when we have the idea of our composition, we have to check whether it really works. To check whether the composition really works, we all have our smartphones. So, let's just stand in the best place open the camera app and let's try to shoot. I'm switching to lens 0.5, switching to pano 
and trying to shoot my favorite composition from one side to another okay I'm done let's check it now you can see this composition really works the scene is beautifully closed by the forest here the leading line is leading to the composition to the village from the other side it is beautifully closed by, by the valley here the sky is okay the ratio sky to the ground is okay this composition works so we can shoot it using our camera while this advice sounds very simple i consider it to be one of the crucial ones uh, from the practice of photo expeditions we can often say the following a photographer comes to us and says that the conditions were great and that he took an amazing panorama. When checking the data, however, we find that the piece of composition is missing. Therefore, the photo will not be as great as expected. And the first question arises whether he took a test panorama with his phone. In 100% of cases, the answer will be no. So please, let's not underestimate it. And one more tip related to composition. From practice, we can say, that there are two groups of photographers. In the first group are photographers who have the gift of seeing composition immediately. They simply come somewhere, look around, and right away know what they want to shoot. Photographers in the second group are much worse off. They come to a place and see nothing. However, there is a good news even for these photographers. Seeing composition can be learned. It's all about practice and frequency of shooting. The more we shoot and the more we repeat the basics composition rules, the faster we will master the ability to see composition as photographers in the first group. So if you belong to the second group, don't despair. Everything can be learned. And another piece of advice or recommendation. You have surely heard about the basic compositional rules. Among them is, uh, for example, the rule of the golden ratio and the related rule of center which suggests that he should not place the main subject in the center of the photograph. Additionally, there is the rule of splitting the photo, stating that the photo should not be divided in a one-to-one -one ratio of sky versus landscape, etc. Uh, how to deal with these rules? It is certainly recommended to follow them particularly when we are beginning our journey in photography. These rules will help us avoid major compositional mistakes. On the other hand, we always say that we shouldn't strictly follow these rules at all costs. Uh, if it makes sense, then deliberately break the rules. Uh, for example, the rule about splitting the photo between landscape and sky. I have taken many photos that are divided in a one-to-one -one ratio. Personally, I say that if the sky is as attractive as the landscape, then let it be represented in the photo in a one-to-one -one ratio. Why not? However, if the sky is just a uniform blue, then we should really leave it with only a small presence in the photo. And that's all for today, friends. What can you look forward to next time? Uh, of course, another video about panoramic photography. We are far from done. Uh, by the way, did you enjoy our video? If yes, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. And as always, if you have any experiences shooting panoramas, encountered any problems or anything else, please write to us in the comments under the video. See you soon.